On behalf of Global Financial Integrity and MINDS, we thank you very much for coming today to talk about our new report on illicit financial flows in Brazil and with the help of our panelists, see how this issue is impacting other countries with which Brazil deals, what the consequences are, why we should be caring about this issue, and finally, at the end of the day, what we might be able to start doing about it. The timing is very good with Brazil having the exciting election coming up in just a couple of weeks and then the presumably second election. And it's we're very happy to be here to be talking about this and we look forward to this issue hopefully continuing with the help of all of you with further conversations and further research and analysis going forward. My name is Christine Clow. I'm a senior program officer at Global Financial Integrity in Washington, DC. You have hopefully gotten a copy of the agenda for today. If not, we have copies out on the registration table. We will go through our morning sessions and then we have lunch at noon and that will be up on the first floor in the restaurant up there. You can take the stairs or there are elevators over near the stairs around the corner. We also have copies of our report out on the table for you, again, near the registration. We have copies in English, and we have copies in Portuguese. Please feel free to take extra copies if you would like to bring them to colleagues. And you can also always download the report from our website, gfintegrity.org, and in Portuguese and in English. For those of you who are on Twitter, we have set up the hashtag IFFs Brazil, so that's I F F S B R A Z I L. Sorry, we used our American spelling. And we will also be on Facebook, and we encourage you to follow along and engage with us there if you would like and put out your comments in English, Portuguese, or whatever language you may wish. Uh, just another couple of housekeeping notes. The bathrooms, if you need them, are just around the corner to the left and then the left again. And if for any reason uh, we have to leave the building for an emergency, uh, please use the stairs that you probably used to get down here this morning. So without further ado, I will introduce our opening speaker. Raymond Baker is the president of Global Financial Integrity and the author of Capitalism's Achilles Heel, Dirty Money and how to Renew the Free Market System, which was published by John Wiley and Sons and is cited by the Financial Times as one of the best business books of 2005 when it was released. He has for many years been an internationally respected authority on corruption, money laundering, growth, and foreign policy issues, particularly as they concern developing countries and emerging economies and impact upon Western economies and foreign interests. He's written and spoken Extensively, he's testified often before legislative committees in the U.S. and Europe and elsewhere. And he frequently appears on television and radio and newspaper interviews. Mr. Baker is a member of the high-level panel on illicit financial flows from Africa, which was chaired by the former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki. This committee, for those of you who have been following it, will be releasing a report on their findings of their process very soon, and I encourage you to look out for that. He also serves on the World Economic Forum's Council on Transparency and Anti-Corruption, and he serves on the Board of Directors, the Center of Concern, and the Policy Advisory Board of Transparency International USA. He previously served as a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution, and at the uh, Center for International Policy. Mr. Baker's previous experience for many decades, or for several decades, was in business, uh, particularly in Nigeria and Africa, but he has also had much experience in Latin America and Asia. And he founded Global Financial Integrity in 2006 as a follow on from the successful publication of his book in 2005. So, Without f uh, further words, I will bring up uh, Raymond to welcome you all with more formal remarks this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me add my welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. 
We've been looking forward to this, um, and we're delighted uh, that we have finally been able to add Brazil to the countries that we have studied uh, concerning our subject matter. Let me begin with a story. I got off the airplane in Lagos, Nigeria in 1961. Lagos, incidentally, was named by Portuguese traders who uh, were going up and down the west coast of, uh, of Africa. Um, and I, I was taking over the management of a uh, company. I didn't have any idea uh, about uh, Africa, so I, I fairly early got into a conversation with uh, a gentleman that had been in Nigeria for many years. He was somebody we call an old coaster, had been there for a long time. Um, he was British. He was the managing director of a company called John Holt Trading Company. John Holt had been active up and down the west coast of Africa since the late 1800s. And I asked this gentleman, how do you do business in Africa? And he looked at me uh, and, and was not very forthcoming. I, uh, I got the distinct impression that he did not like Americans showing up in his ex-British colony. Nigeria had become independent just the year before. He didn't like us showing up uh, so quickly. Uh, uh, after independence, so he wasn't he wasn't uh, ready to answer the question. But I pressed on, as is my American manner, um, and I asked him, "Okay, well, how do you price your imported cars and building materials and textiles to sell in the Nigerian market?" And he looked at me again and he said, "Price? Price is not a problem. I'm not trying to make a profit." And I thought to myself, not I had just finished two years at Harvard Business School <laughs> learning all about how to make a profit. And here, the first person that I meet in West Africa, or one of the early people that I meet in West Africa, says, I'm not trying to earn a profit. What is going on here? It took me a while to figure out that uh, he was talking about transfer pricing. He was talking about um, uh, overpricing what he was importing from the parent company in the UK in order that all profits were transferred out within the, in, within the invoice of what he was uh, uh, bringing into the country. Uh, he was using the pricing mechanism to shift his profits uh, abroad. It took me a little longer to uh, realize that uh, a great many foreign companies were doing the same thing. And it took me longer yet to uh, understand that a great many Africans who were involved in imports and exports were doing the same thing. Um, and then it took me a lot more years to realize that this is a phenomenon that uh, is uh, typical in Latin America, Asia, the Middle East, and so forth. It's a global phenomenon. But nevertheless, thus began my education on the movement of money uh, across borders uh, in an unrecorded and a hidden uh, manner. Now, fast forward, uh, I spent 35 years in business all over the globe. Uh, then, as Christie said, moved into the think tank world at the Brookings Institution, wrote a book, and we established GFI in 2006. Global financial integrity does basically four things. We analyze unrecorded financial flows across borders. In doing this kind of macroeconomic analysis, we utilize data filed by governments with the World Bank and the IMF. We do not pull numbers out of the air. In order to be credible, we limit our, our uh, analysis to data filed by governments with the World Bank and the IMF. Um, every once in a while, the government will tell us, for example, the uh, um, attorney general of a country came to us uh, not long ago with a dozen of his government officials, and, and he says to us, this data can't be right. Uh, and we said to him, uh, sir, it's your data. It's data that you file with the World Bank uh, and the IMF. We didn't invent the mechanisms for analyzing this data. We use models 
that have been around for 20 years or so. What we did do, what GFI did do, we were the first country to take those uh, analytical models and that data and apply it to all developing countries in order to come up with an estimate of how much money drains out of all developing countries. Currently, that figure is about a trillion dollars uh, a year that moves unrecorded out of uh, developing countries. Um, compare that to foreign aid. Foreign aid is running about 130, 135 billion dollars a year. We're talking about an outflow that is oh, seven or eight times uh, the amount of foreign aid inflow. This makes no sense for the richer countries or for uh, the countries that are receiving uh, foreign aid. Macroeconomic analysis is a key part of what GFI uh, does. The second thing uh, that we do is policy advisory work. We work with governments to curtail uh, this reality. Um, we work um, in confidence with governments. We bring together a team of experts um, in law, economics, uh, accounting, uh, auditing, uh, corruption, uh, uh, money laundering, uh, and so forth, in uh, customs uh, policy and so forth. We work with governments, counterpart teams, in order to address uh, this unrecorded flow of money and what you can do to uh, curtail it. A third part of what we do is advocate uh, for greater transparency in the global financial system. And we work with um, a number of other uh, nonprofit organizations around the world to promote financial transparency, to promote the ideas of, of, uh, trans, of financial transparency's contribution to curtailing these unrecorded uh, financial flows. And we'll talk more about that um, uh, later uh, today. Another part of our work, um, a fourth part of our work, is specialized economic analysis of particularly serious problems that developing countries are facing. Um, you can call it economic intelligence work. We do this for governments. We don't do it again. We do this for developing country governments, and certainly not against uh, developing country governments. Um, let me give you an example of a study that uh, we have done, and this much was made public by the government uh, for which we uh, uh, did this. Um, uh, Nigeria, the government of Nigeria. Nigeria is a country that I continue to stay very close to. Nigeria asked us to do a study of um, the theft of oil in the Niger Delta, what's called bunkering. Um, how much oil is stolen out of the pipelines of the Niger Delta? And what we did in that piece of work was to triangulate the problem, to use three different approaches to the development of uh, uh, information and insight and data on this in order to uh, come up with an estimate. The first element was satellite imagery. Um, millions of satellite images were analyzed. Um, and the result was we conveyed to the Nigerian government the latitude and the longitude of every point in the Niger Delta from which oil uh, was being stolen. The second part of the analysis was interviews with the criminals themselves. How do you do that? Well, you go in without a cell phone. You do not ask them to identify themselves by name. You go through a long series of questions in which you're uh, asking about uh, problems uh, uh, in their area, rapport building questions. And finally, you get to the point that you're asking about what they're doing. And we conducted 60 interviews with the criminals, every one of which, to, uh, every one of whom told us exactly what they were doing. We had no problem whatsoever uh, in getting them to tell us exactly what they were doing. Um, and the third part of the triangulation exercise was um, uh, interviews with 
oil industry executives um, to get their take on the problem. The oil industry executives were less forthcoming uh, than the criminals uh, because this theft gets mixed up with corruption uh, uh, in Nigeria, and they didn't want to talk about it uh, very much. But nevertheless, having done that triangulation process, we were able to uh, tell the government of Nigeria that uh, the best estimate is six to 12 billion dollars a year of oil being stolen straight out of the pipelines of the Niger Delta. Um, this is an example of addressing the biggest aspects of illicit financial flows um, in order to help governments figure out how to uh, address those, uh, those kinds of problems. The study that we have done concerning Brazil is um, the fifth study in a series that has been funded by the, the Ford Foundation. Leonardo Berlamequi, who is here, has generously funded this work over a period of five or six years, uh, Leonardo. Um, and we have done studies of India, Russia, Mexico, the Philippines, and now uh, Brazil. And there will be a book coming out uh, from this process um, that um, will summarize what we have learned from just the study of these five countries. We've had funding um, from other sources and have done smaller studies of a great many other countries. But Leonardo, thank you very, very much for your funding of this. Uh, most, uh, most appreciated. Um, we will go on today into much greater detail concerning the results of this study uh, as they have uh, impacted uh, Brazil. And we will also get more deeply into how do you address this problem? What do you do about this? Okay, we've got a problem. How do we, uh, how do we go about uh, trying to curtail this uh, reality? So I think by the end of the afternoon, you will have a good idea of what's the magnitude of this problem and what can be done to address it. Again, thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to getting uh, to interacting with all of you. Thank you.